So what do we conclude from this thus far? A, that there are essentially two styles in the New Testament of syllable counting that are vital to hermeneutics and vital to proving we have the original words of Scripture that we're not aware of, one of which is prophetic of the data of the future. Okay? Forty years from when Christ talks, the temple goes down. So that's why 49 is used here, because they're going to be in diaspora. All right? That's the same meter that Daniel 9 uses. So it's not just the Old Testament where meter counting, syllable counting, for the purpose of knowing the future, is used. It's here in Matthew. And Matthew ends up being, and I'm going to contend this now, the grand central station for prophecy in the New Testament. Wait a minute, I got a cough. <coughs> the reason I make that contention and then here we got Luke deliberately moving the words around. See, here's the 49 again. In order to link events that are depicted here in Matthew to their causes or conditions or successions and relations, which is the decree of God. If you go to seminary, that's you know, I remember my pastor talking about that. The decree of God is his all-wise and sovereign purpose, the, the um, decreeing in all its causes, conditions, successions, and relations, and determining certain futurition. Something like that. You should have heard that in seminary if you were in seminary. Wait a minute, I got a cough again. <coughs> So here we see that decree played out in history by the very Lord himself and he's sevening to show good and bad periods of history because 49 is bad, it can be good because that was also when the reconstruction of the temple started. And 126 of course is famous in Isaiah but 42 is good because that's the number of people that Jacob came out with when he came back to the land from Haran. So, you know, you, you play with these numbers, okay, which Luke is doing so he shows you how it works. And he's moving the text around and yet linking to the same concepts that the Lord says up here. So he's showing you how it works. But this, Matthew, okay, is history, future history. And this is future history that Luke is, you know, through the Holy Spirit, saying, hi, here are more prophetic details that are linking up to different places to show the, the continuity or the consistency or the parallelism to what the Lord says here for 190 A.D. to its cause, why there is a 190 A.D. back here in 142 A.D., which we'll end up knowing, but they don't know at the time will be Bar Kokhba. Now what Paul brings to the table is a sort of timeless commentary on how you use the Matthew text and the Luke text. And he turns it into a marching song. Okay? And it's got syrupy language to it that's sort of timeless. But it's got also a specific history that he's talking to starting at 1 AD in this case. So that you, in order to pair it up with with um, Matthew and Luke, you have to come all the way down here. So when you're faced with the same text here at 199 A.D. for Matthew, but Paul, but Luke's update to it earlier as the cause of the being led astray. He's linking it to the false. Christ of the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. And Paul is saying, okay, when you reach that same point in time and you see what Luke is talking about and what the Lord was talking about is something to happen again 57 years later, hint, hint. This is what you're supposed to think. Ex haritos en jamás were being graced out. Now these are disaster periods here. This is a disaster. That's why the 49 is being used. 
There's a disaster period. There's an upcoming disaster period 57 years later that the believers to be aware of as a result of seeing this disaster at Bar Kokhba. Okay, fine. Those are the those are the future facts. See, because it's got the same. See, here's planets that you're going to be deceived. You're deceived here. And now let's say that the believer is sitting there, you know, outside of Jerusalem now because of the, the rebellion. And he's looking at it and he's thinking about it. And then, oh, wait a minute. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen here. It doesn't say it's Rome. It doesn't say it's Christians. It just says it's going to happen again because this is what happened here. See, I got my current history, and now I can look at the future, and oh, it's going to happen again. And so you teach your kids, hi, 57 years from now, this thing we just saw with Bar Kokhba, some version of it's going to happen somewhere again. Okay, that's a fact that you learn. All right, that hasn't happened yet. Paul is saying, hi, here's what you think about those facts, both now and then. You're being graced out. It's a disaster. It's a bad thing. But you're being graced out because God makes good on everything, Romans 8, 28. Now, Peter ends up coming in, therefore, adding to it. Okay, but I don't know quite how he's adding to it. I just know that he's doing it because he's using the same language. So somehow Peter's text here updates Paul. So what does that tell you? That tells you just as Luke updates, comments on, adds parallelism to Matthew. All this under the Holy Spirit. And just as Paul is telling you how to think about those things while they happen, here with the example of 141 A.D. after Bar Kokhba, so also Peter is updating Paul about what to think about, because Peter's writing after Paul's dead, what to write about. Okay? Now Peter is writing 84 years after the temple started to be rebuilt under Herod. Peter's just about to die. This is August of 68 A.D. when Peter writes. And, you know, I, I spell all that out here so you can read it. Okay, so he's sort of doing a eulogy, eulogetas, ha ha ha, on Paul. Just as Paul was doing a eulogy on Christ, starting at Christ's birth. The day you die is the day you're born to eternity, ha ha. Okay, so Paul, um, Peter is updating Paul in some manner. How he's doing that, I don't know. But it's clearly the same theme. What should you be thinking about as these events in history unfold? The events in history that unfold, that are foretold, are in Matthew, updated by Luke. But Luke's only going through the first thousand years. Matthew, by contrast, is a Talmudic completion of the seven thousand. Doesn't mean it's gonna history is gonna actually run in seven thousand years. It's just that was the way the Jews understood it at that time, so he runs the timeline out that far. But what are you supposed to think of through the time that you're living in? Okay, this stuff happens. Okay, this is gonna tell me what's gonna happen, but that doesn't tell me how I live through it. Ephesians tells me how I live through it for the first four hundred thirty-four years. Okay, but Paul is dead when Peter writes. And so Peter's saying, well, here's the update on how you keep on thinking. Because Peter himself is only writing in 68 AD. He's just about to die. <laughs> Paul died sometime spring 68 AD. This is coming out in August. Second Peter comes out in September. And I explain that in the Luke Dateline meters, but you can just read this too and see it. Alright, so somehow some way this is a commentary on what you should think about while you look at and ponder these future events as they're told in you know Matthew for 3220 years long and Luke for 1085 years long first commentary on how to think about those years is in Paul 
and then Peter adds the commentary. Now the next question naturally is going to be, well after Peter dies, who continues the commentary? Well, Jude continues it, then Mark plays on Jude, and the writer of Hebrews plays on Mark, and I've done all those videos so you can see why I say it that way. Mark is very clearly the third gospel. Why people don't understand that, I'll never know. They're not paying attention to the text. The writer of Hebrews, whoever it is, it could be Luke, it could be Barnabas, I don't know. It's not Paul, that's the only thing we're sure of, because... Uh, Hebrews 13.23 flat tells you it's not Paul. Um, the writer of Hebrews is playing on Mark, and then after the writer of Hebrews, which is written in the year of the four emperors, there's a silence until John. John is somehow playing on this in Peter and this in Paul. I know for sure he's playing on Ephesians 1.9 because Revelation 17 is an is a update on Ephesians 1 9. See musterion? That's the key word that's used in Revelation 17. It's the key word for church. And Revelation 17 is about fake church. In other words, it's, people don't, they're not believers, okay, or they're apostate and they're pretending to speak for Christ. See, false Christ, that's still a continuation of the exact same theme that Matthew does with the parousias anaphora that next occurs in Matthew 24, 27 and occurs three more times and with the amen le bohumin anaphora and then there are other key words that, that Matthew uses to, to illustrate this theme of history of false Christs and you're supposed to counterthink using Ephesians, you counterthink using Peter. You counter think using probably what, what the other writers tell you also, Jude, then the writer of Hebrews, and then John. Exactly how you're supposed to do that counter thinking and how they update each other, I don't know yet. I know they're doing it. For sure I know that Revelation 17 is an update on this verse right here. Because this is about the seven mothers who come back into power um, from 205 forward. I mean they're already in 205 that's when Septimus Severus dies. So they're in power but they fall out of power and then they come back in power right here. This is when Macrinus um, who killed Caracalla, their, their nephew or their son, he, he dies. They come back into power at this point and this is what produces the crisis of the third century which most historians date approximately here or here, because Se um, Severus Alexander dies three syllables before in Altoy. So Severus Alexander dies right here. He served up. Set forth means to set forth food on a table. So he's set up on the table and then comes the crisis of the third century, which is why Paul puts his 14 years in here. This is the period of Decius and all that. Okay, so it's a why commentary on that future. And what you're supposed to think about while it's happening is, okay, God is building up the time. This is actually a pregnancy metaphor right here, pleromatos, filling up. Fill, it means to fill up a cargo of a ship or a woman. Pleroma. Plero is the verb. Okay, and Peter's playing on Paul. Okay, now how do the other writers play on Peter? Jude, and the writer of Hebrews, and then John. How do they do that? That they do that, it, it becomes obvious. Where and how they do that, I'm not so sure yet. If I live long enough, I'll get sure, but I don't know now. So here's the data, okay? And then you use Paul and the other writers to figure out how to think about that data. Here, during the time of Decius. Okay, so this is like the doctrine that should be in your head during these times of history to counter or think about or orient to those times of history as updated later by Peter and the other writers. And how far does that update go? 
Does John end up taking time further than Matthew does? I don't know. Maybe. I haven't abstracted it all yet. Maybe you will. Maybe God will give it to you to do. Because I don't think I'm going to live long enough to answer all these questions I'm posing right now. So that's the story as it stands now. And the next increment we're probably going to go back. Because I'm going to show you how these anaphora work to demonstrate to you how you can know what I've just said so that you can interpret 2016 in light of Donald Trump.